People are dying of waterborne diseases in flood hit Pakistan. Government must order NDMA to immediately appoint qualified and experienced environmental engineers to tackle the public health emergency in flood affected areas to save millions of humans from diseases caused by floods. I repeat. Government must order NDMA and Planning Commission to immediately appoint qualified and experienced environmental engineers to tackle the public health emergency in flood-affected areas to save millions of humans from diseases caused by floods. Overseas Pakistani public health and environmental engineers should be requested to immediately come to Pakistan and help fight public health problems. Doctors with degrees in public health and epidemiology must be immediately appointed at NDMA. 9. Die of gastroenteritis, diarrhea and malaria in Sindh in the last 24 hours as the crisis overwhelms the country's health system dengue fever is also spreading. Waterborne diseases are a new concern in flood-ravaged Pakistan, with the authorities reporting at least 9 such deaths in the last 24 hours, according to government data. All the deaths caused by diarrhea, malaria and gastroenteritis were reported in the southeastern Sindh province where more than 300 people have died of flood-related ailments since July. Sindh officials said more than 500,000 people are still displaced by the calamity and living in makeshift camps across the province. Meanwhile, the National Disaster Management Authority, NDMA, on Tuesday said the death toll in the catastrophic floods has risen to 1,559. Pakistan was battered by record rains and melting glaciers beginning in the middle of June. The floods at one point submerged one-third of the nation of 220 million people, destroying more than a million homes and dozens of roads, railways and bridges. The government, already facing an economic crisis, estimates the total financial losses due to the floods at $30 billion and has appealed to the global community for help. Floods victims can be seen standing beside their tents at relief camps. Officials in Sindh, home to 48 million people, said more than 137,000 cases of diarrhea, over 10,000 cases of dysentery and at least 4,000 confirmed cases of malaria were reported in the province this month adding that they have set up 450 medical camps to tackle the health crisis. The biggest challenge we are facing is because of malaria and gastroenteritis. We don't have enough protective nets or medical kits to detect malaria. Relief organizations and the government are regularly supplying us with required material but the magnitude of the problem is just so huge. Amjad Mastoy, a health official in Sindh's Dadu district said, Shanaya Salangi, a 53-year-old teacher in Sindh's Nashero Feroz district, said his family was not receiving much help from the government. Two of my children, 12 and 18 years old, have malaria for the last two weeks. We have run out of tablets. The fever breaks at times but returns in the evening. Salangi said his family of 12 members is living in a makeshift house they built on higher ground after their village was swept away a month ago. We don't have any family in other cities so we along with few others from our village decided to stay back, he said. Last week, the World Health Organization, WHO, Chief Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus warned of a looming health disaster in Pakistan. I am deeply concerned about the potential for a second disaster in Pakistan, a wave of disease and death following this catastrophe, linked to climate change that has severely impacted vital health systems leaving millions vulnerable. He said in a statement, the WHO chief said pregnant women were at risk in the affected areas. All this means more unsafe births, more untreated diabetes or heart disease, and more children missing vaccination, to name but a few of the impacts on health. He said, the United Nations Population Fund in August cautioned that more than 650,000 pregnant women in flood-affected areas require urgent maternal health services, with at least 73,000 women expected to give birth in September. Dr. Khalid Memon, a health official in Sindh, said they are compiling data on pregnant women taking refuge in makeshift camps. Our district health officers are deployed across all the affected areas and so far we have registered at least 9,500 pregnant women, he said, adding that expecting mothers were being given food supplements and anti-tetanus vaccines.
Since Health Minister Dr. Azra Fazal Pichuho said many villages remain inaccessible and a true picture of the spread of disease and displacement of people will only emerge once the waters recede. Floods have drowned most roads and highways. Boats are being deployed as not just means to rescue people but also as mobile health camps. They are also asking medical universities to send their final year students for assisting in flood relief efforts. Things and I've never seen anything like this. Um, and I have, as you've mentioned, been to Pakistan uh, many times. I came first because of the, the, the generosity um, that the Pakistani people have shown the people of Afghanistan over the years and as a host country. Um, it's often the countries that, that don't have as much that give more than so many other countries. And now at this time we see it's the countries that cause less damage to the environment that are now bearing the brunt of, of the disaster and the, and the pain and, and the death. Um, I, I, I am absolutely with you in pushing the international community to do, to do more. I feel like we say that often. We speak of, of aid appeals and relief and support, but this is something very, very different. Um, I think this is a, a real wake-up call to the world about where we are at. Um, the climate change is not only real and it's not only coming, it's very much here. And, and uh, even as somebody who's been a part of humanitarian aid for years, we often look at a crisis and we think of how to solve it, what, what, what we can do, what to rebuild, or, or um, how to help the children, or food. And now we're, we're in a situation like this where it is the needs are so great and truly every effort is is either a life or death for so many people every current effort and i've seen i've seen the army i've been with the army and and with my colleagues at irc and i've seen uh, those lives who were saved but i've also seen those who i've been speaking to people and thinking if enough aid doesn't come they won't be here in the next few weeks they will they won't make it too many children so malnourished uh, and and uh, and then even if they make it through these next months with the winter coming and the, the destruction of the crops and the hard reality I'm uh, overwhelmed uh, but I don't even feel it's fair to say that because I'm not living this so I just simply try to speak out and help. I, I really can't imagine what, what it, it feels like to be, in, to be there. Um, I, I see the, the very thought out, um, you know, beyond this, uh, this, to not only the emergency, but, uh, but what to do um, and all that it's going to take. And I am, uh, I'm, I'm here as a, as a friend to, to Pakistan and the, to the, the many warm friends uh, and relationships I have here and, and will return, will continue to return. My heart is, is very, very much with people at this time. Many things, and I've never seen anything like this. Um, and I have, as you've mentioned, been to Pakistan uh, many times. I came first because of the, the, the generosity um, the, the Pakistani people have shown the people of Afghanistan over the years and as a host country. Um, it's often the countries that, that don't have as much that give more than so many other countries. And now at this time we see it's the countries that cause less damage to the environment that are now bearing the brunt of, of the disaster and the, and the pain and, and the death. Um, I, I, I am absolutely with you in pushing the international community to do, to do more. I feel like we say that often. We speak of, of aid appeals and relief and support, but this is something very, very different. Um, I think this is a, a real wake-up call to the world about where we are at. Um, the climate change is not only real and it's not only coming, it's very much here. and and. Uh, even as somebody who's been a part of humanitarian aid for years, we often look at a crisis and we think of how to solve it, what, what, what we can do, what to rebuild, or, or 
um, how to help the children or food. And now we're, we're in a situation like this where it is, the needs are so great. And truly every effort is, is either a life or death for so many people. Every current effort, and I've seen, I've seen the Army, I've been with the Army and, and with my colleagues at IRC, and I've seen uh, those lives who were saved, but I've also seen those who I've been speaking to people and thinking if enough aid doesn't come, they won't be here in the next few weeks. They, will, they won't make it. Too many children, so malnourished, uh, and, and, uh, and then even if they make it through these next months with the winter coming and the, the destruction of the crops and the hard reality, I'm uh, overwhelmed, uh, but I don't even feel it's fair to say that because I'm not living this. So I just simply try to speak out and help. I, I really can't imagine what, what it, it feels like to be, in, to be there. Um, I, I see the, the very thought out, um, you know, beyond this, uh, this, to not only the emergency but uh, but what to do um, and all that it's going to take and I am uh, I'm I'm here as a as a friend to, to Pakistan and to, to the the many warm friends uh, and relationships I have here and and will return will continue to return my heart is is very very much with people at this time. You just watched some of the destruction caused by catastrophic flooding taking place all across Pakistan. And currently 33% of the country is experiencing flooding and tens of millions of citizens have been displaced as a result of flooding. We're looking at a humanitarian disaster on a massive scale. And to really put things into perspective, I wanna look at some satellite images taken on August 28th that really 
capture the sheer enormity of the flooding. This is courtesy of Axios. So as you can see here, these are village fields in Rajanpur. And these were taken by Maxar. And you can see the village before flooding. And then after flooding, the entire village is nearly submerged with water coming up to the buildings. Now here's another look at fields in Rajanpur just completely devastating on an unfathomable scale. Now, this was the Indus River before and after flooding. As you can see, massive difference. Now, finally, these are fields and homes along the Indus River in Rajhan. And it's been a catastrophe, needless to say. And I just want to emphasize this is an ongoing disaster. And this is a climate change-induced disaster. Now, for more details, we go to Common Dreams, where Julia Conley explains, with hundreds of thousands of people displaced, more than 4 million crops destroyed, and nearly a million homes demolished or severely damaged, Pakistani officials and rights campaigners on Monday called for a major international aid push following flooding throughout the country, fueled by the fossil fuel-driven climate emergency and an unprecedented season of monsoon rains. More than 30 million people are in urgent need of help, the International Rescue Committee said after conducting a rapid needs assessment three days after the Pakistani government declared the flooding, which has killed more than 1,000 people, a national emergency. Both the IRC and government officials have explicitly linked the flooding to the climate crisis with IRC country director Shabnam Balak noting, despite producing less than 1% of the world's carbon footprint, the country is suffering the consequences of the world's inaction and stays in the top 10% countries facing the consequences amid a monsoon season, which has so far seen 784 percent and 500 percent more rains than average in Sindh and Balochistan provinces, respectively. The IRC is anticipating a sharp rise in food insecurity as 71 percent of Pakistanis surveyed by the group are already without access to sufficient clean drinking water. So to say that the situation is bad is an understatement. Now here's some facts. These are just preliminary statistics all subject to change. These are estimates. So take all of them with a grain of salt by the time that you see the, uh, this video. These will likely have been revised. But here's what we, what we know so far. As the article pointed out, more than 1,000 people have been killed. I believe the current estimate is around 1,400, but again, that's just an approximation. Take that with a grain of salt. Uh, over 30 million people have been displaced. The highest estimate that I've seen is 50 million. Now, we, when you consider that the total population of Pakistan is 226 million as of 2020, we're looking at almost a quarter of their entire population being displaced. Imagine how many people this affected. It's just, it's hard to grasp how bad this is. Um, as I stated earlier, 33% of the entire country has been flooded. 63% of pregnant and lactating women are considered extremely vulnerable. 40% of people don't have access to critical health care, which is something that is a necessity at this time, considering the fact that IRC reports that they're seeing increase in um, skin infections, malaria, and cases of people having diarrhea. So it's it's bad. Now, I want to go to a statement from Pakistani's climate minister because what they say is really important. Pakistani climate minister Sherry Raymond did not mince words Monday as she pointed out the link between the climate crisis and the suffering of the tens of millions of people directly affected by the flooding. Quote, this is very far from a normal monsoon season. It is a climate dystopia at our doorstep, Raymond told agents France Press. We are at the moment at the ground zero of the front line of extreme weather events in an unreal relenting cascade of heat waves, forest fires, flash floods, multiple glacial lake outbursts, flood events, and now the monster monsoon of the decade is wreaking nonstop havoc throughout the country. And she's absolutely correct. Now, the problem is that things like this, extreme weather events, are going to get a lot worse, especially considering a study that was released on Monday, which essentially states that the rise of ocean sea levels is accelerating. The Washington Post explains human-driven climate change has set in motion massive ice losses in Greenland that couldn't be halted even if the world stopped emitting greenhouse gases today, according to a study published Monday. The findings in the journal Nature Climate Change project that it is now inevitable that 3.3% of the Greenland ice sheet will melt, equal to 110 trillion tons of ice, the researchers said, that will trigger nearly a foot of global sea level rise. So what we're seeing in Pakistan, this is just the beginning. It's going to get worse. So when their uh, climate minister says that this is a climate-induced dystopia, they're absolutely correct about that. 
And as the Common Dreams article stated, they are responsible for 1% of global greenhouse gas emissions. But countries that have benefited from industrialization and emitting the most CO2, like the United States, I think we bear a lot of responsibility for this. So we absolutely should be sending them aid and doing what we can to assist them. Because again, this is a humanitarian crisis on a huge, huge scale. And it's just, I don't know what to say about this. It's its not like this is a one-off event where you can say, wow, this is unfortunate, but thankfully this isn't very frequent. Unfortunately, this is going to be a common phenomenon in our climate dystopian future. Now, if you want to take action and help, I'm going to link you to the International Rescue Committee where you can donate. And thank you to Emo Dragon on Twitter for recommending this organization. They're going to need all the help that they can get. So if you can chip in a buck or two, then that will be much appreciated, I'm sure. So that's where we're at, where now in this day and age, you can no longer deny the reality of anthropogenic climate change. It's right here and it's affecting people in a substantial way. So anyone currently who still is denying the reality of climate change, like Tucker Carlson, who just did that the other day on his program, who said global cooling is the real issue. These people now are enemies of humanity. They don't care about the suffering. And as the Washington Post article citing that nature climate change study pointed out, even if we stopped all greenhouse gas emissions today, we're still going to see the sea level rise. So what we've done is irreparable harm to our planet. The best that we can do now at this state is try to mitigate some of the damage, but we're still not taking this seriously. Thankfully, the Democratic Party just passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which does provide funding to invest in clean, green technology. The problem is that we're still not taking this seriously when we see goals about reducing, you know, greenhouse gas emissions to 2005 levels, 40% of 2005 levels, whatever that may be. We need to stop emitting greenhouse gas now, like yesterday. But we, we're not doing that, and that's just at this point in time, it's not going to happen. So if we're not going to take action, then we have to assist the countries and the islands uh, that are going to experience this because it's going to be devastating. It is literally going to kill countless people. So if we're not going to do anything, we at least need to take responsibility and assist them and provide them with immediate aid because this cannot stand we cannot just allow them to suffer and do nothing when they didn't contribute as much as we did to this current crisis i mean they barely contributed comparatively speaking so we've got to do what we can to help them and the u.s government needs to take action right now